Hello and welcome back to Bookish and welcome to my evaluation of All the Pretty Horses. I have been talking about this uh, mostly last month where I wanted to go back and read the Border Trilogy of Cormac McCarthy and kind of reevaluate. I read these books a long time before I ever got on BookTube and I have to admit that when I read them the first time I really thought uh, they were great um, and they really appealed to me and I uh, believe that McCarthy was uh, a great writer. And, you know, having been on BookTube and having expanded my reading and, you know, I'm not limiting myself to primarily uh, male American writers, I've, I've begun to question that and question that from the opinions of other people here on BookTube. And as you may or may not know, Steve Donahue and I have been engaged in a good-natured uh, kind of uh, discussion back and forth about uh, Dude Bro Lit um, and what it is and what it isn't. And that got me thinking about these three books, and so I wanted to reevaluate them to see if I still think they're good, to see if I still think they're as good as I thought they were, and then to see if they qualify for Dude Bro Lit according to Steve's Seven Deadly Sins. So I'm going to try not to give any spoilers, but I do want to give you a plot summary because the plot of the book uh, is important to kind of uh, the evaluation of the book, in my uh, opinion. Uh, also, I don't usually make notes uh, for my videos, but I did for this one, so if you see me looking down, I'm looking at my uh, little steno pad. So plot-wise, John, John Grady Cole is a young man who lives in Texas, and he knows horses really well. He understands them on an almost instinctive, maybe spiritual level, and they understand him, and he can ride, and he can calm horses, and he can break horses. He is incredibly skilled. The ranch he lives on in Texas was started by his great-grandfather back in the 1840s. The action of this story takes place in the years right after World War II. Uh, by the time John Grady Cole is uh, 17 years old, his mother has inherited the ranch. She's an actress who has no interest in maintaining the ranch, which is what John Grady Cole loves more than anything else in the world, is riding horses and being on the ranch. She's going to sell the ranch, so he and his best friend, uh, known as uh, Lacey, or his best friend Lacey Rollins, or Rollins, decide they're going to head out for Mexico and try to find work uh, on a ranch in Mexico. Uh, they head south from Texas uh, to cross into Mexico. Along the way, they pick up with, or they're joined by uh, a young boy, a runaway around the age of 13, maybe 14, named Jimmy Blevins. Rollins predicts from the very beginning that Blevins will get them into trouble and be uh, a source of nothing but trouble for them, uh, something that, that proves to be true as soon as they cross, almost as soon as they cross into Mexico, Blevins begins causing problems for them. Uh, one problem, a really big problem, John Grady Cole and Rollins escape from, but they lose track of Blevins in the process. After that problem, John Grady Cole and uh, Rollins uh, find work on a big horse ranch uh, in northern Mexico owned by uh, a wealthy man and it's there on that horse ranch that John Grady Cole's uh, skill with horses and at breaking wild horses and identifying good horses uh, uh, puts him in good with the owner um, of, of that ranch uh, who gives him a good job and he stops working regular stuff and he gets involved in horse breeding. Um, that owner of that ranch, of course, has a beautiful daughter about the age of John Grady Cole. She is beautiful. She's mysterious. She loves horses. And so naturally, John Grady Cole falls uh, in love with her uh, and pursues her, uh, despite the fact that he knows, and Rollins warns him, this is not necessarily his best interest. This pursuit of Alejandra, uh, who is the young lady, it does not go unnoticed by um, her family. Her great aunt, uh, who is uh, a powerful figure within the family, uh, something of a matriarch, who lives uh, on the ranch, uh, essentially brings John Crady Cole in, meets with him, and tells him that his relationship with her uh, great niece is impossible. Uh, they play chess, they like one another, he admires her, she clearly admires him, but she still uh, doesn't want him to be with her, her niece for reasons that will be explained later. John Grady Cole pursues this relationship anyway. Uh, eventually, uh, connected to the problems that they had, the trouble they got into with Blevins, Cole and Rollins are going to be arrested. Uh, they go to prison. They get out of prison uh, in a kind of miraculous fashion. At this point, Rollins decides that he's going to go back to Texas, that he's not going to do what John Grady Cole uh, was going to do and what John Grady Cole was going to do is he's going to go back to the ranch and try to uh, get with Alejandra. Uh, 
he meets with the aunt again, who explains her backstory, her life story. You get an idea of her thinking and why she does not want her uh, niece with John Grady Cole. Uh, he and Alejandra uh, hook up one more time, and then he heads back to Texas. He gets in more trouble. He escapes, and he makes it back to Texas and his friend uh, Rollins. That's essentially the plot. Uh, of the story. So then, you know, the big question for me was, is it a good book? And I'm going to tell you, yes, I think it is a good Western, if not a wholly original story. I think it works as a Western. The The problem with McCarthy is, is that he is clearly uh, trying to elevate the Western to the level of great literature, that that's, I think, how he sees himself and where he thinks his claim to literary greatness will lie in kind of taking these stories about these men of the West and elevating them in some way. But if you strip away that, and you can call that an attempted art, you can call that pretension, you can call that succeeding art, you know, uh, evaluating a book based on its structure, based on its sentence structure and its writing and its plotting, you can definitely do that and tell a good book from a bad book, but I'm not sure you can tell a beautiful book from an unbeautiful book, because at some point art and beauty become a matter of opinion. And that is where I think that I, I probably differ uh, a little bit from Steve Donahue about this book. Um, so there's some good things about the book, uh, I think. One, you know, it is a basically good, interesting Western. And if you were just interested in reading Westerns, I, I don't think this would hurt you at all. Is it as good as Lonesome Dove? No, not even close. Uh, it's not nearly that good, but it's a pretty good uh, Western, and it's it's a lot shorter. I think John Grady Cole is exactly the kind of hero you expect to find uh, in Westerns. He is quiet. He's passionate. He's incredibly skillful. You understand him and his motives. They're simple. They're pure. You can look at that as a negative in terms of literature, but in terms of Westerns, I don't think that's particularly uh, unusual. I think probably the best thing in the book to me is the friendship between John Grady Cole and Rollins. Uh, that friendship and the way it works and the way they uh, mesh with one another and the way they understand one another is almost completely described through dialogue through those two young men talking to one another, which are very Hemingway style uh, conversations in which what's uh, left unsaid is more important than what is said. Uh, but I think that's really, I think that's really well done, and I think that friendship um, is is a good part of, of the novel and helps drive it forward. There are some things uh, in McCarthy's work here and in other places that I think could irritate and do irritate people. Uh, it's widely known, or maybe not so widely known. McCarthy doesn't put quotes around dialogue; he just starts the dialogue uh, as though it's just a part of the of the paragraph. Uh, even though sometimes he does, you know, start a new paragraph. There's no quotes, and that can be <clears throat> confusing. I don't, I don't have a problem with that, but I can see where, you know, it is kind of unnecessary, and it, it, it feels pretentious. Uh, number two, he sometimes mashes words together to imply movement, uh, speed, um, the rapidity of thought. Maybe he's trying to achieve something like poetry again, whether or not he succeeds at creating uh, that feeling, that pacing, or, you know, art, uh, poetry, I think is, is somewhat subjective. Um, and then he sometimes writes really long, uh, dense sentences uh, with no punctuation that are intended uh, to convey, I think, the, how fast and jumbled people's thoughts are. And I'm going to read you an example of that and how it works. Hopefully it won't be too long, but it'll be pretty long. There were times in those early mornings in the kitchen when he returned to the house for his breakfast with Maria, stirring about and stoking with wood the great nickel-mounted cook stove or rolling out dough on the marble countertop that he could hear her singing somewhere in the house or smell the faintest breath of hyacinth as if she'd passed in the outer hall. 
that was one sentence. On mornings, uh, when Carlos was to butcher, he'd come up the walkway through the great convocation of cats, all sitting about on the tiles under the Ramada, each in its ordered place, and he'd pick one up and stroke it, standing there at the patio gate, through which he had once seen her gathering lines, and he'd stand for a while holding the cat and then let it slip to the tiles again, whereupon it would return at once to the spot from which it had been taken, and he would enter the kitchen and take off his hat. Anyway, so you get the impression of what I'm talking about. So there are a couple of things about that passage that I read I think are uh, exactly what irritates people uh, about McCarthy. A, it's just a long run-on sentence. B, it is incredibly over-descriptive. And I'm going to tell you what I think he's trying to accomplish. And again, I think whether he accomplished that or not, that or not is somewhat subjective. He's attempting, I think, to accomplish that kind of rushed feeling of thoughts and emotions uh, that go on in your mind when, you know, you're in love and you're obsessed with, with seeing the uh, object of your desire. And every place she's been has some meaning to you and, you know, all kinds of stuff like that. I, I think that's what he's doing. You also probably get uh, the feeling from that uh, description that McCarthy um, includes a lot of description uh, in the book, and he does, particularly when it comes to landscape. Uh, and sometimes I think that description of the natural world works, uh, and sometimes uh, I don't. So I'm going to read you an example of where I think it's good and it works, an example of where it's not so good and it doesn't work for me. So this is the good example. On the mesa, they watched a storm that had made up to the north. At sundown, a troubled light. The dark jade shapes of the Lagunitas below them lay in the floor of the desert savanna like piercings through to another sky. The laminar bands of color to the west bleeding out under the hammered clouds. A sudden violet-colored hooding of the earth. So, there are a couple things about that, and this is where I think there's some subjectivity. Either you like that... <laughs> or you don't. I guess you could be indifferent, but I don't know how you could be indifferent about something like that. For me, that works. Does he use words that are uncommon? Laminar bands, uh, laguanilas, you know. Does he use imagery which, you know, you might find and seen, see somewhere else? Yes, but for me, that works. Is it punctuated perfectly? Are the sentences created perfectly? Do they contribute to the story of the plot? Maybe not. They may fail as literature in all those ways, but in terms of, you know, creating uh, a beautiful scene, it works for me. And then here's an example of when I don't think it works. When the truck finally pulled out and they saw him still standing, they offered their bundles for him to sit on, and he did so, and he nodded and dozed to the hum of the tires on the blacktop, and the rain stopped, and the night cleared, and the moon that was already risen raced among the high wires by the highway side like a single silver music note burning in the constant and lavish dark, and the passing fields were rich from the rain with the smell of earth and grain and peppers and the sometimes smell of horses. Okay, so you may think, well, <laughs> what's the difference between those two? The difference between those two is if you're laying in the back of a truck and you're looking up at the sky, the chances that the moon is going to align in your vision with the power line seems almost impossible to me. And this is like an image where, therefore, he's creating an image in his mind that I don't think necessarily can be created uh, or is likely to be created in real life. So again, to me, whether or not you appreciate this kind of writing comes down to taste. Uh, and again, I'm not evaluating as a good writing. I'm not evaluating it as, you know, as the work of someone who, who could maybe in other circumstances, I don't know, put together sentences that are punctuated correctly and aren't run-ons and things like that. I'm evaluating it based on whether or not the image it creates works. And again, I do think there's something subjective about that. So the question comes up, and then my final area of evaluation of uh, Cormac McCarthy's uh, All the Pretty Horses is, is it dude bro lit? So I'm going to base this on Steve Donahue's Seven Sins of Dude Bro Lit. I'll leave a link to his video uh, down below. And so the question, is it dude bro lit? Well, if it has to contain all seven of the deadly sins that Steve lays out, or for, put it a different way, all seven of the things that Steve Donahue sees as hallmarks of dude bro lit, then no. If to be dude bro lit, it only has to contain 
one or two, then yes, uh, definitely. So I'm going to run through those deadly sins. Steve, in his video, if you watch it, it's a really great video, which really, I think, lays out exactly a good way to evaluate things about whether or not we want to consider them in this category of uh, dude bro-ish writing. So the first two are misogyny and sexism. The first two deadly sins are misogyny and sexism. And Steve says these things are present in every piece of dude bro lit. Well, by misogyny, he what he says in his video is that, that women are kind of portrayed as cutouts. They're, they are kind of stock characters that are two-dimensional or one-dimensional even. Uh, they are a seductress. They're unknowable. They're a nag. They're a scold. But this is what, uh, what women are like in dude bro uh, lit. And then the sexism thing, uh, Steve defines as never understanding or getting a glimpse of the interior lives uh, of these female characters. Well, there are only two female characters, there are only three female characters in uh, All the Pretty Horses. John Grady Cole's mother, who is, you know, self-absorbed and is going to sell the ranch and won't keep a money-losing uh, venture just to keep her son happy. You can evaluate her based on that any way you want to. There's Alejandra, who is definitely the mysterious seductress. I mean, <laughs> We don't like to know very much about Alejandra at all. She is exactly uh, that kind of one or two dimensional cardboard cutout character uh, that Steve's talking about. But the aunt, the aunt, Alejandra's aunt ruins this idea that this is misogynist. She is the strongest character in the book. She's not a nag. She's not a seductress. She's not mysterious. Uh, she meets with, she likes John Grady Cole, she loves her niece, she understands the attraction, uh, but she does not think that would be good. And her reasons for not thinking that relationship would be good had to do with her own past, which we learn about, and what happened to her, and her love, and how that was disappointed. You know, we see, not through her eyes, necessarily, well, we do kind of see through her eyes, her interior life, and her history, and her motivation. And so, you know, if all it takes is one female character to have depth, to, to be something other than those stereotypical things, then I, I think the aunt is that, even if she's a little bit Mrs. Havisham uh, in some ways. By the way, McCarthy is a real magpie for style. Sometimes he's Hemingway, sometimes he's Faulkner, some, there's, a little Dick, there's more than a little Dickens in there. Um, you know, one of the big criticisms I would have of him as a writer is I'm not sure he has a style all his own. He's just an amalgam of other people's styles, uh, which have been processed through him into a Western. Anyway, that's off the point. So in terms of, to me, the first two sins of Dude Bro Lit, All the Pretty Horses does not, does not contain those. The next two sins are uh, inventory replaces description. That is, a list of things replaces a description of action or what's going on. And then that that inventory has an almost kind of talismanic meaning in terms of hearkening back to the olden days, the old ideas, and the old ideas of manhood in particular. Uh, and that those two things then work together to appeal to men uh, by reminding men that, you know, things used to be different and things were better in the past and this is what real men were like. If, if those are sins of dude bro lit, then this book has that. Uh, I mean, John Grady Cole is pretty well <laughs> specifically described uh, by that. He is the Western hero. He is skilled. He has something unknowable. He's quiet. He's tough. He's smart. He's passionate. He's all those kinds of things, and he's good at the manly arts. He is all those things, and the book contains numerous passages that are just really inventories of things. There is an incredibly long section about John Grady Cole and Rollins breaking a whole bunch of wild horses at the ranch in Mexico. And we get a detailed description of exactly the actions they take and the names of all the equipment they use, and it fits perfectly with this. So, if this is our only thing to evaluate Dude Bro Lit, then it definitely is. Uh, Sins 5 and 6. Uh, Sin 5 says the book mimics playing a video game uh, in that uh, the action just skips from one thing to another. Uh, kind of randomly, um, and that, you know, it's all about action and, and stuff like that. And then since 6 says it's not meant to be read as literature uh, with thought and nuance, etc. It's just about surprising you and jolting you. Well, I think for the number 5 one, uh, that the first 100 pages of the book cannot be described in any way like a video game. 
As a matter of fact, uh, it can be argued that those pages are boring. It's really just the two uh, young men traveling south and descriptions of, you know, how they camp and stuff like that. In other words, it it falls into other areas that the Dude Bro Lit uh, sends, but, but not that one. Uh, in terms of number six, it's not meant to be read as literature. You're not mean, meant to think about it or to think nuanced thoughts about it. It's just supposed to appeal to your adrenaline uh, and your need for action. You know, and it's supposed to surprise you and be unpredictable in that way. This, there's nothing about this plot that's, not, that's unpredictable. As a matter of fact, Rollins pretty much predicts everything that happens in the book before it happens. Uh, so, you know, if you read it and you want to know what's going to want, you're going to want to know what happens, just listen to what Rollins says, because Rollins is constantly warning John Grady Cole about what's going to happen, and he's uh, almost always right. So I don't see this as unpredictable. I don't see it as being all that full of surprises, even though there are some, but, you know, uh, lots of books are full of surprises. And then sin number seven is that it's addictive in a way that ruins your ability to appreciate literature. I don't think this book does that. Uh, if it did, uh, I don't think I would have gone on and read uh, anything else. Now, did I read the other two books in the Border Trilogy? Yes. Did I read Blood Meridian? Yes. Did I read Sutri? Yes. <laughs> so maybe it is addictive, uh, but I'm not sure it actually ruins your ability to understand other literature. I mean, the book can't be both pretentious in an arty way and then only appeal to your adrenaline. And I don't think you can, even if you think McCarthy's pretentious writer, he is pretending to create art, and pretending to create art is not appealing just to your adrenaline and not intended to be addictive as like, you know, I've got to read this because the next action thing's going to go on. I think if you were to read this book, you'd find that it is relatively easy to put down. So to me, again, uh, the, it's just a Western. Uh, it's a pretty good Western, not a great Western, not incredibly original. Uh, I think McCarthy attempts uh, to to create art uh, with his descriptions of the landscape. Uh, to me, the the book is more like an old John Ford uh, western, like The Searchers, you know, with uh, John Wayne as kind of the ultimate flawed western character uh, and going about and doing manly things amidst a beautiful backdrop. I think. I think that's a pretty fair description. Um, you know, I think it's possible that McCarthy uh, saw this book as a stepping, or, or this book as kind of a stepping stone, and maybe this series of books is a stepping stone in McCarthy's career, because I think what McCarthy really wants to be is a movie maker and a screenwriter, and I think if you look at his books as they go along, they become increasingly more like a not incredibly well fleshed out um, screenplay. Uh, the Road uh, qualifies for that. Uh, um, certainly No Country for Old Men, which actually I've been informed uh, began as a screenplay. I think that's the direction McCarthy's going, and I think in part it's because McCarthy is more interested in the commercial aspects of writing than he is perhaps in the artistic aspects of writing. Uh, anyway, there you go. That's my reevaluation of Blood Meridian. Is it great? No. Is it good Western? Yes. Is it dude bro lit? Well, in some ways, yes, and in some ways, no. It just depends on whether or not it has to commit all seven deadly sins or it can just commit some. Anyway, there you go. There's my evaluation, review, if you will, of All the Pretty Horses by Cormac McCarthy. If you read this, I'd really like to hear your thoughts in the comment section uh, below. And as always, thank you for watching.